Thank you so much. We are going to have somebody whom I consider a badass sister. Amena back here. When you see flashes around the world with energy, with everything that we have to look at how we drive our lives, there are people that answer, that bring up facts, questions, and who would have thought an African woman is today one of the badasses when it comes to driving energy, putting energy facts out there. She walks with kings. She walks with presidents and ministers, but never loses her common touch. I think Roger Kipling would be proud of her. Amina Bakke, please come and sit. What an intro. Thank you, NJ. You're badass, too. You're not supposed to ask the questions today. I'm usually in your seat. And by the way, just for everyone's uh, full disclosure, I got tricked into being here. He said, come have coffee with me, and here I am. If I took, for a journalist, they always ask questions. But, I mean, uh, your story is so inspiring. Tiny little girl, as they call you, what does it take to be able, first of all, to gain the trust of very important people in the world to tell you things that they wouldn't tell any of us? I think it all starts with a dream. Um, as a child, I've always known that I wanted to be a journalist. I had the snack of finding things out that I shouldn't be normally finding out, telling my mother, telling my father, and I've earned the nickname Reuters, or Reuter, as we call it in Egypt. So I knew immediately I needed to work for this Reuters news organization. I wanted to become a journalist. So one, finding a passion. Worrying about everything else that comes, I mean, I mean, this generation uh, worries, I think, so much about their income, uh, being uh, head of their company, CEOs, and so on. I think that's regardless. You need to find your passion first. Second is getting an education that supports that, fashion, that passion. And that's absolutely necessary, especially as uh, women and especially as Africans. Um, so that's something that I would advise anybody that's still working, I mean, to, looking for a job, is to find an education that supports this passion or who you want to become. And third is finding the people who can support you. Um, building that network, not being afraid of applying to things, NJ, that they tell you no. Um, you wouldn't believe how many interviews I did until I got my first journalism job. I've gotten thousands of no's before the first yes. Um, and when it comes to your question about how do you get people to trust you, yes, I mean, it's just a matter of um, knowing that these are people uh, at the end of the day, not uh, reacting to titles and um, just sharing your knowledge, communicating, being down to earth. And I think people really appreciate that and that's how you earn somebody's trust. You just gave me a journalist trick right now so I know how to keep you guys at bay. But uh, you have always led this drive for energy. The ability to still talk about markets but always look at energy poverty in Africa and Africa's needs to develop. How do you balance that while still driving up a world-class story and still bringing in, I would say, the voice of poor people in the room that, for the most part, is not always thought. You and I have been in many of these meetings where we see our counterparts from America. It's all about numbers and money, but you've always been able to bring the little girl in Egypt or South Africa, her voice in the room. How do you manage that and still keep moving up the corporate ladder every day? 
I think in energy, um, like with other sectors, NJ, um, we have to stop relying on people and telling our story. We need to tell our story ourselves. And this is something that I was quite keen on from the beginning, is that I want to tell my story, I want to tell my country's story, I want to tell the energy story, and today, um, we live in a very divided world when it comes to even the topic of energy security. It's become incredibly divided. Uh, transition pressures, uh, you're seeing countries that are saying, okay, it's not your right to, to develop, you need to have more renewable energy, uh, don't get your oil and gas out of the ground because this is uh, a bad form of energy. Um, and they completely ignore the idea that Sometimes it's our time to industrialize. You said it so eloquently a few days in, uh, in Riyadh. It's Africa's time to industrialize, while other parts of the world, they could decarbonize. They could make up for years and years of carbon emissions they've caused when Africa as a continent emits maybe 3%, a little bit lower, you have the stats better than I do, of, of the global emissions. So this is a balance that needs to happen and we need to take charge of our story and tell our story, which is critical uh, when it comes to energy security. And the reason I chose, I mean, among the many subjects uh, in, in journalism, I chose energy because it's so critical. You need energy to switch on the lights. When this war happened between Ukraine and Russia and Europe uh, suffered, the first thing they went to, NJ, is burning coal. They burn coal, wood, and now they're saying, okay, never again, we're going to transition. It doesn't work like that. There are intermediate steps in between. And um, unfortunately, um, a lot of the, the general public aren't educated enough. And it's our role in the media to educate the public, uh, not to put pressure on these politicians to just say outrageous things that are not practical. You mean Clarence? <laughs> Where's Clarence? You know, you're so good right now that some people say you're politicians, but I don't know if you say outrageous things, so we, we're waiting for that. But I, if there is a young girl or a young man watching right now and thinking about going to the top where you are. You've already discussed a lot about believing in yourself and education, but what would you advise them as entrepreneurs and they walk away from being a journalist based on experience on what you've seen, because you've seen everything in this industry with a lot, uh, uh, with a lot of really important people. How can they get themselves in the room and be part of um, that energy revolution that we want to see across the world, whether it is renewables or whether it is uh, fossil fuels or whatever they want to do. Again, I will go back, it's super cliche, but I will go back to uh, the point about passion. If you believe in yourself enough and are passionate, you uh, will have the drive to achieve things. Um, since I'm Egyptian, I'm gonna use a very uh, Egyptian example here. Uh, most of you know Amar al-Sharif, the uh, Egyptian actor. He did the movie Lawrence of Arabia. And I watched Omar talk about that movie and they said uh, when they interviewed him for it, uh, they asked him, could you ride a camel? Could you ride a horse? He said, I'd never ever ridden a camel or a horse in my life, but I told him I could because this was Lawrence of Arabia. So don't be afraid to learn on the job. Even if you can't do it, just, you know, throw yourself in there. Take the, the chance. If this is something that you want to do and are passionate about, don't have these fears uh, stopping you. Let me switch on the other side. We're looking at markets today where in most black and brown communities, and this is not just Africa, but black communities in America, in Europe, they are the first to get hit by energy poverty. One of the th key things that you have se you have seen that you do a lot is data. Can you talk to us a little bit about the power of data and information in really dealing with our energy development and how we can make sound energy decisions based on data. 
Yeah, data is, uh, is key. I've recently kind of switched over from editorial to research for that reason that you mentioned, NJ, is having the, the data could be read and data could be biased also in many, in many forms. But We've just seen a lot of biased data, especially very much. In, black, in, in black and brown communities. And that's why, I still, I, I, that's why I'm asking this question because most of the times the data that has, been sh always, has always been shown about our communities it's always skewed, but we are not in the room looking and um, being part of who is creating that data, who is sharing that data, who is building that narrative. And that's why I'm asking this question about the power of it in, 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 in our decision making. Yeah, we need to have more transparent data coming from first uh, primary sources, as we say, on the ground to get an accurate picture of what we're going. I mean, the stat that uh, I just told you about 3% of world emissions comes from Africa, that still shocks a lot of people. They're like, oh, really? That's, you know, the, the, these communities are harmed the most by climate change while, you know, you have higher emissions in, in, uh, in the more... Uh, developed uh, countries in the world. So um, the gathering of data, primary source, and again, uh, I'll go back to the point of telling our story, providing this data in a transparent way. And unfortunately, NJ, I mean, a lot of the agencies are still Western uh, agencies. Uh, perhaps like the, the, the data could be skewed, opinions could be skewed, when, especially when it comes to um, uh, the African continent or even Asia. I've seen a lot of misconceptions. The IEA, for example, who that do uh, long-term forecasting on energy, they don't even consider Africa as a growth. When, whenever you ask that question, they, they don't factor in the growth of Africa in their forecasts. Which so why, is, I should stop right there. Why is that, though? Because if you're looking at growth and dealing with energy decisions around the world, this is a continent that is 1.4 billion people right now. Energy poverty is high. And by 2040, it stands to hit what, um, two billion. Why is it that the IEA, that it's one of the most important in the world on energy security, for looking at energy forecasting, doesn't f factor in that continent? Good question. I need to ask them next time we see them. They never have a straight answer for us, including when we were in Riyadh. I, I believe somebody asked them that same question. and. Um, Perhaps they don't see the potential. I mean, the focus is mainly when you're talking about energy demand, um, they, they look at China, they look at India. These are the main kind of drivers. Of course, uh, you have uh, Europe and, and in the US on the other side. But Africa, I think, is very much underestimated. And we are at a point, and if this um, energy transition does materialize, Africa is front and center. Do you know why? All our critical materials are in Africa. I mean, this is where the source of all the critical materials you need for the batteries, etc., will be uh, extracted from Africa and South America. Uh, Chinese happen to have an upper hand on that in both continents, but um, this is something that we really need but to pay how, attention how to. Do, how do we then, and to the audience here, and you don't have to be an energy expert, how do we then play a role in not only becoming passive bystanders or active um, spectators. How do we play a role in being part of that critical mineral exploitation, um, exploitation and processing in the continent? What we need to do it locally, preferably, if you need to build the experience, our youth, give our youth jobs in this sector, have uh, companies that are uh, not dominated by foreign players primarily. Sure, use foreign uh, investment, but make sure that it has a component, like many of the Gulf countries here, we're seeing a big component of it is to have Emirati employees being trained or Saudis being trained. So um, I, I think this is a huge opportunity for, for Africa. And from our side, NJ, I mean, our politicians need to make it easier to do business as well. Mm -hmm. uh, cut through the red tape, give incentives, uh, because the, the, there, is, uh, there is a lot of value. Amena, I think I have so honored to be the first person to interview a journalist. <laughs> thank so, you, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll let you say any final comments, as I know. I mean, I have to fly to Saudi Arabia. I was in Saudi Arabia with her on, uh, last week, and she left, and she's going back again. But then, and I really, really thank you 
for letting me trick you into this. Because I knew if I, told you, if I told you why, you wouldn't do it. So I had to tell you you're coming to have coffee. And this is a great coffee chat. So I really, really, really appreciate it. So any final comments before you leave? Final comment is, thank you, NJ. This has been a very pleasant surprise to be here. And um, I want to give you credit, too, because you seriously has, have been part of my support system throughout this energy journalism journey and now through research. It's because of people like you that I can succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.